Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, one of the, a couple things I want to do as we just get started. Uh, first is, uh, let's say a prayer, if that's okay. We are kind of in a chapel, so <laughs> if that's okay with you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we give you praise and glory. We ask you to please um, receive the gift of our time tonight. Receive the gift of our presence tonight. Um, as we sit in these chairs where so many, so many have studied and prayed in, the, in this in this. Um, space where so many people have worshipped you, we ask that you please allow our uh, presence and I'll allow our hearts, allow our praise to you um, to join with theirs, that you may be glorified in all things, Father. Father, receive our praise in the name of your Son, Jesus. And hear our prayer. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, we ask that you send out your Holy Spirit in abundance upon every person who's gathered here in the way that you alone know that we need you. We entrust uh, our hearts, our lives, our wounds, and those we love to your love. And we ask you to please bless us. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. Um, again, second, the second, six, da, 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 da. maybe we do need an editor. <laughs> I think maybe. Um, he said unfiltered. I'm like, shoot. It's way easier to sit in front of a camera and be like, okay, take two. Um, take two is thank you all. You all have somewhere else to be tonight. Um, not somewhere else you should be, but you somewhere else you could be tonight. And I, I, on the way in here, though, if you're a seminarian, I was like, do you have to come to this? They're like, yes, we're required to. Um, <laughs> But everyone else, you, you had a choice. And I just, that, that, that's not wasted, that's not lost on me, that you could be somewhere else. And maybe you've driven a long way. Um, maybe you've had, unlike the seminarians, longer than a five-minute commute to get to this place. Um, and I just, I just want to let you know that I know that you made a sacrifice to be here. You could be so many other places. Um, so I hope this time honors you and honors the Lord. Uh, third thing. This will be kind of a relatively brief presentation. A father mentioned that there are discussion guides after my homilies because those are not relatively brief. Um, but after the relatively brief presentation, there's going to be a Q&A section. And I thought that would be really fun. I don't, I don't ever get to do those. And so I thought it would be really, really fun to be able to do this because I came in tonight relatively intimidated. First, I was intimidated because like, yeah, Archbishop Shapiro will be there. I'm like, what the? And they're like, no, he's not going to make it. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> And then, and then it's like, it's the arch, or the Cardinal Foley lecture series. I'm like, lecture series? Like, I don't, I don't give lectures? What the heck? I mean, I do give stern talkings to, but like. <laughs> and then thirdly, or fourth, whatever number we're on right now, um, they said it'd be in this chapel. And I was like, I visited this chapel a couple times filming for Ascension. And I'm like, what the, No. Give me like an auditorium, somewhere that's like less intimidating than the most like, intimidating chapel I've ever been in in my life. <laughs> so that being said, um, last thing before we launch into this. Uh, Father also mentioned that I'm on campus uh, with our students and maybe this is for the seminarians a little bit. Uh, growing up and even working at parishes, there was something I noticed that sometimes it happened when the priest was away, when the pastor was, was gone. It was like everyone's like, oh, okay, now we can breathe. <laughs> like, okay, now he's gone. Now we can just relax. And now we can, like, the cat's away kind of a situation. And I always thought, like, I wonder if that's, like, going to... Is that, is that always the case? That when, when father's gone, people are like, phew, thank the Lord. Um, and I just have to say that last night after Mass, uh, my students, they, they knew I was coming out to Philadelphia. And... They, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to be back tomorrow at noon. But they were like, Father, we're going to miss you so much. Like, it's just, it's not the same here when you're not here. And just that sense of like, really, to my, my brothers, seminarians, the heart of your formation is to become a dad. So when you leave, the people in the parish, your students, your kids. So like, even if you're gone for a day, like, we miss you, we can't wait till you get back. Like, that's the, and that's the heart of it. Does that make sense? Also, just bragging how much they like me. So, um, 
No, you know, at Newman, we, at the, our Newman Center, it's, it's small. It's, it's a little house, really. Um, and uh, we have a motto around the house because it's just kind of like a, again, we, our two-car garage is our, is our daily mass chapel uh, that's been converted. In, in, on Sunday mass, we set up in the ballroom. It's like, you, yeah, you have the big, big place. No, it's not a big, well, it's a big ballroom. But other than that, um, it's kind of small. And so we have to own it, right? You have to own the community. And so one of the mottos we have in that community is um, see a need, fill a need. We don't have custodians or anyone. And so it's like, see a need, fill a need. So students, you're part of this community, and so you know this. You know that if you see something out of place, like, do something about it. And one of the things we try to do in that is not just, like, clean up after ourselves, but one of the things we're trying to inculcate in our students is that notion that um, you don't actually have to wait for permission to do good. You never have to wait for permission to do good. Like, you never have to wait for permission to share the gospel. You never have to wait for permission to help someone. You never have to wait for permission to talk to someone. You don't have to wait for the priest to come in to do the thing. And you don't have to wait for permission to replace the toilet paper on the toilet paper roll. Like, you don't have to, like, it's, it's real life stuff, but it's also so clearly what it is to be a Catholic Christian. You never have to ask permission to do good. Because we've been already, we, everyone who's baptized, we've already been given a commission. We've already, already been told what to do. In so many ways, I mean, just let's go back to it. The end of Matthew's gospel, what does Jesus say? He says, go out into all the world. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. One of the things that Pope Pius VI, Pope Paul VI, talked about in Evangelii Nuziani, the evangelization in the modern world, he said, that's what evangelization is. It's not... It's not just one thing. It's not just the kerygma. It's not just proclaiming Christ. It's the whole thing. It's going out into the world, proclaiming Christ, the kerygma, evangelization, making disciples, like growing them up, baptizing them, so sacramental life, bringing them into the covenant, and catechesis, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And no one in this space, no one here, has to wait for permission to do those things. I'm not saying go baptize people on your own, but I'm saying like, like, there's a sense of like, he's already told you this is your job. He's already actually, you've been anointed that this is your job. If you've been baptized, you've been anointed that this is actually what he wants you to do. And there's something so, I mean, to realize, here's Jesus who's actually entrusting, ever, ever think about this, the fact that, the fact that he left, ever think about that? That in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus is standing out over the city of Jerusalem at at Bethany, and the apostles look at him and say, Lord, are you at this point going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Basically, hey, we believe who you are. We know that you are the one you say you are. You know, we know you're the Messiah. We know you're going to restore the kingdom. We know you're the Savior of the world. So are you going to restore, are you going to bring this to the whole world right now? What does Jesus say? In response, he says, basically, it's not for you to know the time or seasons, because that's, okay. But then he says, it's like, I'm not telling. But then he says... But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the ends of the earth. Like think about that. The apostles, Lord, are you gonna bring all of your mercy to the whole world? And he's like, No, you are. Lord, are you gonna bring salvation to the world? No, you are. Lord, are you gonna bring hope and justice and peace and all the everything you are? to the world. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, no, you are. With my power, with my spirit. And this is the spirit that dwells in you. This is the commission that's been extended to you. And so what do we do? We do what we do at Newman. We look around the world and we see a need. The motto is, see a need, fill a need. But I don't, before I go any further, here's what I want to ask, because this is not just about, there, you know, sometimes we talk too much about going out, and I just want to take one moment and go in. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, ever since, um, well, for a couple weeks, which for me is for a lot. Uh, and um, if you remember the, the gospel reading from uh, two weeks, two Sundays ago, It was John's gospel about St. John the Baptist. 
And St. John the Baptist, he says this about Jesus. He says, uh, I did not know him. I hadn't really ever focused on that ever in praying through John's gospel. How many, tw- twice, John the Baptist says, I did not know him. When he came here, I did not know him. And I just think about this. Here is, how many times is that us? And you could say, well, John, are you kidding me? You're cousins to this guy. But you could say the same thing about us. Like, are you kidding me? You were raised in the church. And just because we're in the vicinity of Jesus it doesn't mean that he's in our hearts. John the Baptist ultimately is going to say, the reason why I came baptizing, this is really interesting, I just think is John the Baptist sums up his entire mission, his entire, actually his entire meaning for existence. You think about like, the reason why my mom and dad couldn't conceive a child for so long, the reason why uh, God had to appear to, well, the angel had to appear to my dad in the temple. The reason why he was struck dumb. The reason why they named me John. The reason why I lived in the desert. The reason why I wear camel hair. The reason why I've been eating honey and locusts every day of my life. The reason, John says, the reason why I came baptizing is to make him known. So these two things, which is in fact, in fact almost one thing that John says sums up my entire life. The reason why everything in my entire life has ever happened is to know him and to make him known. My entire life. Why did this happen? Because I need to know him. Well, why did that happen? I need to make him known. Because there is a need, right? And one of the greatest needs that we have right now in our day... Sorry. The greatest need I have is to know him. You you guys, you can talk about Jesus all day. In seminary, they talk about Jesus all day. If you have church work, you talk about Jesus all day. But that's not the point. The point is, I need to know him. Because there's a need in my heart, and I imagine there's a need in your heart to be able to say, my life doesn't make sense unless I know him. My life doesn't make sense unless I know him. And my life is unfulfilled unless I make him known. Like, think about this. My life is unfulfilled unless I do absolutely everything in my power to, to know him and to make him known. Because I have a need in my heart, and so I need to fill a need, and I need to fill it with him. And there's a need in our world, and that need is to bring him there, because that's the Great Commission. Lord, are you going to go to the ends of the earth? And he just says, no, you are. Lord, are you going to send someone to my, to my niece to tell her about how much you love her? He says, yeah, I am. You. <laughs> to know Jesus and to make him known. You'll receive power. And the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. And that's the need. And so we fill a need. How do we do it? Um, you know, there's so much, when we talk about like new media, and we talk about the media, that, uh, gosh, I, I, told, I told Father Daly, I'm like, I don't know, I just like, hit record, and then I hit stop, and I go to the internet and upload it, and like, I don't know anything about this. And he's like, it's okay, just tell stories. I'm like, fine, I can do that. <laughs> because that's the heart of this. Isn't the heart of the kerygma, isn't the heart of evangelization just telling stories? They're just, they're just awesome stories because they're true. Like, the heart of evangelization is telling the true story about Jesus. Not only Jesus, what he did when he was alive on this earth, those 33 years, but also Jesus, in the last 2,000 years, what he's done on this earth. Jesus, what he's done in your life and in my life. This is the heart of evangelization. Tell the story. And make it as simple as that. How do we do evangelization in the modern world? You tell the story. Because I have no idea how microphones work. 
I have no idea how to upload stuff. I, I know how to upload. I have no, no idea how to edit it. I have no idea how to do any of these things. But I tell you what I do know how to do. I know how to say yes too often. <laughs> so let me tell you a story. Maybe it's boring. It, that's a great way to start a story. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story. It's pretty lame. <laughs> Most of you will wonder, why is he telling us this story? No, um... People will ask me, they'll say, like, how did you get involved? How did you get started with the whole, the whole deal? I'll tell you. Here's the story. Um, so um, Jesus uh, changed my life when I was 15 years old. There's a whole story about that. I'll skip that part. Um, started following him at, pretty seriously right from there. Uh, also really poorly. Followed him really poorly for roughly up until now. Um, <laughs> just you, We do our best, right? Just kind of, man, keep falling down and keep asking God to help us. Long story short, I get ordained in 2003, and I was in a parish for two years, and it was such a gift, such a gift to be able to be uh, away from school. Just to be like a real parish. I'm like, wow, there's people who aren't just my age around here. This is amazing. The world is full of other people. So I got to be in a parish for two years, and that was awesome. And then they said, my bishop said, I want you to go back to the university. I'm like, okay, well, fine. Um, but when I was in 2007, so I got to campus in 2005, in 2007, one of our students um, asked me if I would like to record my homilies, and I said, no. <laughs> and she said, why? And I was like, well, that seems a little self-aggrandizing, doesn't it? Kind of seem a little bit like I, I need to inflict my opinion on the world. Like, that seems weird. She's like, no, 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 it'd be fine. Because um, what about the former students who are graduated and they still want to, you know, their spiritual father to speak to them? I'm like, Okay. You know how to sucker me into all these things. I said, but I, I can't, like, I don't know how to do that. She said, don't worry about it. You hit record, hit stop, I'll take care of the rest. And so it was just a student whose idea it was. And then it was a student who said, I'm going to teach myself how to do podcasts. And a student who said, I'm going to teach myself how to post homilies. I'm going to teach myself how to make a website. And the student said, I'm going to teach myself how to use iTunes. And they said, oh, there's this other thing out, another uh, you know, pod bay or podcast, whatever. I'm going to teach myself how to do that so that what you do can get out there because of what I do. So I said, okay, that sounds easy. And then the next step was... Um, there's this guy who worked for Lighthouse Catholic Media, and uh, he was walking by his teenage son one day, and his teenage son had some earphones in, and he thought, he said, what, what band are you listening to? He's like, I'm not listening to any music. I'm listening to this priest who has homilies online. And the guy was like, that's weird. You're my teenage son. You're listening to a priest <laughs> give homilies. He said, send me some of your favorites. And so he sent him some, and they made a, a CD out of a little homily series I did on the Eucharist. And so that was that next step. Um, they said, can we do that? And I said, Yeah. Will it cost me anything? No. Great. Yeah, go ahead and do it. <laughs> One summer, I led a group of our youth um, to a Steubenville conference and um, got to the Steubenville conference. And it was crazy. On Friday night, they said, our preacher for tomorrow isn't here. Father Mike, could you preach tomorrow at the Steubenville conference? And I was like, sure. I mean, that never happens now, right? Like they, they have this thing scheduled out for like months, maybe a year in advance. And I'm like, sure, sure, no problem. So I did that. And they said, would you come to the next conference and be the priest. And I'm like, sure. And then later on, Ascension contacted me and said, hey, would you want to be part of this confirmation program and write one or two lessons? I'm like, sure. Want to write three? Sure. <laughs> then at one point, I got this message from uh, Maria Mitchell who said, yeah, just my hair from Ascension uh, Press, and they want to have an online presence because people live on the internet now. They live on YouTube. And what Ascension wants to do is they want to make this free because all the 18 to 24-year-olds are living online, and we can't reach the men. So would you want to do little five to seven minute videos? Sure. <laughs> and so that's what brought me here tonight. Because <laughs> one of the things that kind of gets in, it gets in my craw a little bit is um, when people ask things like, how do, hey, how do, you, Father, how do you become like, like a Catholic speaker? Like, well, you get baptized, <laughs> then you start talking. And that's, that's pretty much the sum of that's, that's what it is right there. It just kind of... Because ultimately what it comes down to, I think, in so many ways is... Um, what I found is I just... I think God really wants to use people who just 
make themselves available. That's, I think that's the secret, if there's any secret. God just wants to use people to make themselves available. Not necessarily someone who has a big plan, a strategy, and a vision for the whole thing. That, I love those kind of people. I wish I was those kind of people. I'm not that kind of people. I just know how to say yes. And I think the most important thing, especially when it comes to evangelization and the media, is who are you first saying yes to? John the Baptist. I need to know him. Who am I first saying yes to? I have to be first, I have to first be saying yes to him. And the next thing for me is like, well, um, I'm saying yes to my bishop. I just say yes to him. Bishop says, you're signed here? I say, yes, bishop. And I get asked to do this thing. Bishop, can I go to that thing? Yes. I'm like, great. He says, no. Great. That's when people start, I'm jealous of you, priest, because you have someone telling you what to do. I'm like, just get married. You can do the, have the same thing. <laughs> like, it just, it's really easy. Just find someone and say, whatever you tell me, I'm going to do it. So it just makes it really, really simple. But there's something... You know, I remember this, his man name's John, this, man name is, this man's name is John. He works for Franciscan University of Steubenville in their outreach office. And one of the things he's mentioned to me before, he's like, you know, sometimes, he says, not everybody, but he says, there's some Catholic speakers, you know, quote unquote, Catholic speakers. He says that I know are willing to get on a plane and fly thousands of miles to talk to thousands of people, but they're not willing to cross one street to talk to one person about Jesus. And so that's, well, that's one of those things he told me years ago. And I'm like, I never, ever want to be that person. I just want to be able to... If I can't live my faith where I'm planted, then I can't live my faith at all. And if I can't talk to the people who are next to me about Jesus, then I shouldn't, maybe, I should think twice about traveling somewhere to talk to people about Jesus. But if I'm willing to, this is the thing, the flip side is this. If I'm willing to start talking to anybody about Jesus, then you get to talk to anybody about Jesus. If I'm willing to share my faith with anybody, then you get to share your faith with anybody. Um, Jeff Cavins, some of you guys know Jeff Cavins. Um, he's relatively well known. Um, people ask Jeff about, uh, Jeff, how do I get to do what you do? Like, how do I get to go around the world and like, teach the Bible to hundreds, thousands of people? And Jeff points out, he says, well, the way I developed the Bible timeline is I would sit down at Perkins with one person and I'd walk them through the Bible for hours every night. And because I walked one person at a time, taught them how to read the Bible one person at a time, just sitting in some restaurant in Minnesota, that's why I can get up now and I can talk to thousands of people at a time. Because if I'm willing to say yes to one person, then you're going to be willing to say yes to a hundred people or a thousand people. If you're willing to say yes to Jesus where I am, then I don't have to be worried about where he's going to take me and who I get to see, say, talk to Jesus, talk about Jesus to where he might lead me. Does that make sense? So I'd say, if the question is, how do you get started? You never need permission to do good. Just get started. Well, do I need to buy a camera? Do I need to get like recording equipment? Just, I think you just need to, just need to get started. Because evangelization is telling the story. So, question I could ask myself, question we could all ask ourselves is, when was the last time I told the story? Not even like the story in the beginning. I mean. I mean the story of like, hey, what'd you do last weekend? Oh, super good. Um, well, uh, we went uh, to Ikea for all day, because that's what you do um, all day uh, on Saturday. And that night, uh, I was able, we stayed in, we rented a movie, and then Sunday we got up and went to church. Afterwards, I had brunch with my family, and then went to, that, that little thing. I remember talking to this man at, at where I work out in the gym, and uh, asked him, he went on a trip to, to Colorado. 
I said, how was Colorado? He, great. He said, you skied, we did it, we did it, went to church. He just dropped it in there. And it was like, oh, dude, I go to church too. <laughs> he just told me the story. He didn't say, we went to church. Did you go to church? He just said, he said it as if it was the most natural thing in the world because for him it's the most natural thing in the world. And if that's part of your story, it's the most natural thing in the world. It's part of your story. To be willing to just tell the story to anyone who's right in front of us. How do we evangelize if the new media? Well, we don't if we're not willing to evangelize without the new media. I'm going to say that again because I think it's worth letting it sink in. How do we evangelize in the new media? We can only evangelize if we are willing to do it without the new media. We're just willing to tell our story. But here's, here's a couple of things, and then I want to open up for questions, because there's so much more to say. Um, but one of, the things, one of the things that I do need to say is, I am absolutely convinced that What I get to do is, is not a one-man show. I grit, I get it. I'm the only person in the screen. But like, what I get to do is not a one-man show. It, it, it is so Catholic in the sense of it needs family. It needs community. It can't be done without that. There's so many levels. Here's one level. Um, if someone says, I want to get into this. I want to get into new media. I want to get into making content. I want to get out there. I say, great, you need to be part of a team. Not just because there's some things that you can't do that other people can do, although that's very important. But I mean, think about maybe some of the content that you have been blessed by. Maybe it's, um, uh, shoot, I'm trying blanking. Uh, maybe it's like Catholic stuff you should know, like those priests out in Denver. Maybe it's uh, the Catholic talk show or the Catholic man show, the whole team of, of guys. Maybe it's Abiding Together podcast with the three women, Sister Miriam and Heather and Michelle. But that's a team of people who are able to, like, check each other. A team of people who are like, it's not about them, it's all about him. My mom, whenever I get nervous, I'm going to go somewhere, like, come in here. Like, she's like, what are you doing? I'm going to Philly. I'm a little nervous. It's a lecture. <laughs> Don't worry, Archbishop Shipti won't be there. <laughs> like, I'm nervous. And she's like, just remember who the real star is. Like, mom, I know. His name is Jesus. <laughs> but be part of a team. So you're part of a team that it, it gets to be about him, doesn't have to be about you. And I just think of all the people who have helped, whether it be the podcast. I still have not edited one word on the podcast. Oh, the Ascension Presents. The people who like even just had ideas of like, we should leave the bloopers in. You know, that was, a, that was an actual debate. And Maria fought for the bloopers to stay in. I'm like, the bloopers are my favorite part. Like, that's it. Like, I love, anyways, anyways. So, last thing. Um, some of you probably are, uh, you might be DREs or catechists or teachers, youth ministers, volunteers in your parish. And it happens regularly that I'll talk to people and they say, oh my gosh, Thank you so much. We, we show your videos in our classroom. We show our videos in front of our youth. We show our videos to whatever. And they're thanking me. And I'm like, okay, this is really interesting. Because I don't know if you are, are keeping a score. But one of us has the easy job. One of us has the difficult job. I get to sit in my living room. Sit down. I get to sit down. Hit record and say, hi, my name is Father Mike Spitz. The Sunshine Presents. And I get to talk really fast. And I get to get done. I get to press stop. And I get to go to my computer and upload it. And they're like, okay, but the real only reason your kids, if it's ever helped your youth or ever helped your family, the only reason it's ever helped them is because you're there. If you're like, yeah, my youth could really like it. Hopefully they like it. Um, some of them hate it, whatever. The only reason they even hear it in the first place is because you're there. The only reason why it matters to them is because you're willing to have the messiness of relation, real relationships 
And so that's when people are like, oh wow, it's so courageous to, to put out that content. You said that bold thing about that controversial thing. I'm like, it's not. It is the opposite of courageous to sit in my living room. Let's emphasize this one more time. To sit in my living room, not get any feedback. If I don't want any feedback, I just don't read the comments. <laughs> it is courageous for you to show up to that youth group again, to show up to that classroom again, to actually get into the messiness of real people's lives and say, actually, I think this might help you. And only because they trust you are they willing to listen to me. Because they trust you. Why? Because at some point in your life, you saw a need. And at some point in your life, you chose to fill a need. It, it, it takes a church, it takes a Catholic church to have any, any impact in this world right now. So it takes the people on the cameras, you have Matt and Sean and you have Marisa and you have Lindsay and you have all these people who are continuing to help. But then we also have you are willing to get in people's lives and you're willing to tell your story and tell his story and you're willing to share what you know has helped you because there's one if there's one thing that sums up any of our lives it's the thing that's summed up John the Baptist's life the reason why we do anything that we do is to know Jesus and to make him known so, that was the boring part. The fun part's happening now. We're all going to dance. Okay, you got on this side. Just kidding. Um, there's going to be a line that forms, and Father Daly had mentioned that it's going to form right over here. If you want to come forward, please do and ask, ask your questions. Um, sing us a song. Uh, tell us a joke. In the meantime, um, right, yeah, Father Daly is going to point where you can, you can congregate if you'd like. In the meantime, I'd like to tell you uh, some stories. Something tragic happened before I left uh, Duluth. Um, someone broke into the Newman house and, uh, the night before I left, and they stole my limbo stick. How low can you go? <laughs> Seriously. Actually, the police came by later on, and they uh, asked me where I was between 5 and 7. And I said, um, I don't know, kindergarten, first grade, somewhere in there? <laughs> I'll keep going until you, someone comes up and <laughs> asks a question. So good. Great question. Super good question. Um, so this is completely, obviously, anyone can disagree with anything I say. That's clear. I really like the uh, opportunity that YouTube gives us. Because YouTube offers us the opportunity to like, make a cogent argument. One of the things that I find incredibly frustrating about social media is um, the temptation to fall into like the idea of like the... I remember I, I got to the point where I was convicted of a couple things. Here's one of the things. I was convicted that um, I needed to run away from any attempt to inflict my hit-and-run opinions on the world. And I think that, that, that Twitter is all about that. It's, right, it's your hit-and-run opinion. So, like, I'm going to say blah. I'm going to say this. And then I just get to walk away. And if people agree with me, they like it. And if they don't agree with me, then they don't like it or whatever. But I've never convinced any. I don't ever, I've never seen a tweet and gone, like, wow, I'm going to live differently now. <laughs> I've seen a tweet and gotten mad. And I've let it ruin my day before. Um, but I've never actually seen it used as a real force for good. There's maybe some positivity, like, look at this meme of a dog, and like, okay, fine, that's great. Or maybe here's a scripture quote, or Ratzinger quotes, like, I love those kinds of things. So those are, are, are decent things, but my opinion, when it comes to things like Twitter, like Facebook, yeah, I think p- people can use them for two things. Um, well, maybe more than two, but here's what I, to connect and to disseminate information. I don't think, I, I, I prefer not to use uh, those, I, I prefer not to consume those things. And I, so I have to be really intentional when I go on the internet um, because uh, it's way too easy to be a consumer of social media and it's far more difficult to be a disseminator or a producer or creator of social media because you have to be really intentional about that kind of thing. 
Um, so when it comes to seminarians, okay, here's a little convicting moment. Uh, again, from um, as as dad. Uh, so I was it was it was kind of early on. I just got Twitter and. I was still helping out at a uh, Steubenville conference in Atlanta, and I remember taking off. I was on the plane to fly back to Minnesota, and I was like, oh, I should say something about this because I've seen this on, online before. And I tweeted out something like, um, hey, Stuby ATL, uh, thank you so much for a great weekend, blah, blah, blah. And I got back to Minnesota, and one of my friends, a student, um, held up their phone and said, what's this? I was like, oh, just, it's a trick question? It's a, it's a tweet? And they went like, um, no. This is how celebrities tweet. You're not a celebrity. You're a priest. And I was like, oh. At first I was like, oh. <laughs> but then I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. And, and so, so from then on, I'm like, no, I do not need to inflict not only my hit and run opinions on the world, I do not, I do not need to inflict my opinions on the world. Like, I don't need to share the meal I just prepared for, for, for one, um, you know, <laughs> with the world. In fact, actually, I do. I do. So here's what I do. Um, I take a picture of my food, and then I have a group text of all my family members and say, look what Mikey did. You know, and I, <laughs> and I share it with them because they're people I love, people I, I need to impress, and people that I care about. I don't need to share it with the entire world. So I have a couple rules. One is... Um, I'm not a celebrity, number one. That's number rule number one. Any priest, any bishop, any religious, not a celebrity. I'm a priest, I'm a bishop, I'm religious. Other than that, pfft. number two, I should not share my random thoughts with the world. I just don't think the world deserves it. <laughs> I mean that in a positive way. But I realize this about my heart, I realize this about my heart, that I would be looking for something that I should not be seeking. I'd be looking for some kind of affirmation. I'd be looking for some kind of response, looking for some kind of whatever. And I do not need to do that. That's not, I don't need to give my heart to strangers when I can give my heart to the people who are living right in my midst. Number three, there are some people, and I, I wonder if, I can see this is my temptation of my own self. I don't tweet a lot. I don't uh, Facebook post a lot. I don't Instagram too much. Because I think that if I did, I realized it would be an attempt on my part to keep myself in front of people's consciousness. And A, I don't deserve to be in front of people's consciousness for a picture I took. And B, they have other things to think about. And lastly, um, when it comes to social media, comes to social media um, I need to guard against any attempt to share my hit and run opinions on people. Does that, does that make some sense? Okay, awesome. That, again, people can disagree with that, but uh, that's what I think. So good. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I do love, like, the Internet still. You know, it's not like I'm a uh, Luddite or anything. It's like, I, I love the Internet. And one of the things I love about being able to make the videos that Ascension lets me make is we put them out there, and people can stumble across. They can choose to watch or choose to listen when they're ready. Something so good about that. Like, um, so we have videos that are, you know, here's why the Catholic Church is actually founded by Jesus all the way to, when do you go to bed at night? <laughs> like, that kind of idea. And one of the things that we found, and in, in some of the, like, the, the folks who, who help out so much have said, um, we have people commenting on this, like, wait a second, I wasn't going to watch this because it was a priest, but it actually made sense. And so what I find is when people are ready to make the content, you tell the story, right? You get it out there. And when they're ready, you made it available. And not only that, but your family members, right? Your friends. You can say, like, someone says, um, hey, I'm really struggling with X. And if you've already kind of been exposed to some of these stories, you're already exposed to someone else telling the story, then you get to say, well, actually, what do you think about this? Um, does that make sense? One of the things that we get to do is we get to share each other's content. And so it's not, not, it doesn't have to be proprietary. It gets to be uh, shareable. And it gets to be one of those kind of things where um, we have this massive pot. So people sometimes ask, like, so should parishes start making their own videos? Um, and I, I don't know. If you have a parish budget that lets you make videos and they're going to be awesome, great. That's fantastic. Go ahead. But your parish website can be a, a, a depository of, of other people's content. 
that you just direct people to all the free stuff that's on the line, on the line, online, and um, just, yeah, share it. One of the things that we've found helps so much is that um, when people are willing to share what's been said, then there's almost no limit to the reach that we can have uh, with the videos, with the podcast, um, because, last thing, Sherry Waddell, in the thresholds of conversion, what's the first one? The first one is a level of trust, or second level, the second level of trust. And if you're in a relationship with that person, and they have some degree of trust with you, and you say, well, just, hey, watch this, tell me what you think, that can go so far. And if I get to be the person, like, or you make content, and you're someone who is consistent, then they realize, okay, they can trust you too. That's what I would say to anyone who's who's interested in creating when it comes to this, not just sharing, not just distributing, but creating, is one of the things we absolutely need to be is authentic and consistent. It's one of the reasons why, um, one of the reasons why I don't tweet, because that's when I would be inconsistent, because I'm really angry right now. I'm like, no, I need to be more winsome. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that... Uh, thank you for the question. It's very good uh, and very helpful. I think probably so many of us, um, even if your job is to pray, uh, I think that it can be difficult to find time to pray. And so one of the questions is always going to be... Uh, to what degree do I believe that prayer makes a difference? We had, um, remember the story of Jonah? And there's a, there's a portion, there's a moment in the story of Jonah where it's not about Jonah anymore. It's about the people of Nineveh. And Jonah's going, he's gone through the city and he's declared that 40 days more, Nineveh will be destroyed. And so then the king declares that everyone fasts for days. Then no food, no water, no nothing. And that they actually change how they live. They change what's going on. And it's always struck me that, like, wow, I, they were willing to actually let this message of conversion, this call to conversion, impact and change how they lived. And to think, like, okay, I'm going to stop eating, I'm going to stop drinking water for however long it takes until God has mercy on us. That's faith. What I'm saying in that is I'm saying that God sees, he notices, it matters to him, it makes a difference. And when I can't find time to pray, it's ultimately because I'm not absolutely convinced that God sees, that God notices, that it matters to him, and that it makes a difference. So when I can't find time to pray, ultimately, this is not a crisis of time management, it's a crisis of love, it's a crisis of faith. Because if I truly believed that prayer made a difference, I would do it every time. Sorry, we're human beings. We wouldn't be perfect. I would do it most of the time. Just like I believe that the diet works and I don't do it every time. I believe the exercise works and I don't do it every time. But if I really truly believed that prayer made a difference, it would be the priority of the day. But what if you're really, really busy? Um, I remember Father Thomas Dubay, he, uh, in one of his books, he talked about a prayer for people who are busy, prayers for our moms and dads. And he said, no, no, no. You don't have to pray an hour a day uh, if you're a mom or dad. Like, if you, he said, if you're, if you're a dad and you're okay with being a mediocre dad, then no, don't, you don't have to pray an hour a day. And if you're a mom and you're okay with being a mediocre mom, you're right, you don't have to pray an hour a day. But if you want to be an amazing dad, then yeah, you do. And if you want to be an amazing mom, then, then yeah, you do. Um, and I like that answer. Remember, Father Thomas DeBay said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> By the time Mr. Bay said that, I, I didn't say that. So. Great question. See, I like speaking in generalities. Because <laughs> it's easier. And <laughs> so the question, um, if we're praying on a regular basis, again, nothing, nothing sacred about 60 minutes. That's important to understand, although the show is quite good. Um, 
So it, just a substantial amount. Enough time to grow your faith. Enough time to grow your relationship with the Lord. And I think so some, some people, like starting out for 20 minutes, would be enough for them to begin growing that relationship with Christ. Um, so again, there's no magic number. But how do you do it? There are as many ways to do this as there are saints. I would say this, uh, that for just my own experience. The thing that helped me the most uh, was an intensive moment. It was an intensive retreat that not everyone can take. And so I understand that. But what happened in the intensive retreat was I was invited to pray with the Gospels on a consistent basis that didn't rush through the Gospels. It was, it was to pray with the Gospels through what, things called Ignatian prayer and the Ignatian exercises. And basically what that meant, if, you, if you're not familiar with that, was basically uh, I was invited to place myself in the scene of Christ in one of the Gospels and use your imagination, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, and you can slowly add in the various uh, senses. So first, just to see the scene, just look around. Like, see who's, 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 who's there, what are they doing, what does Jesus look like, what's he doing? And ask the Holy Spirit to guide that imagination. And to return to it as often as you need to. See, the thing is, for too many of us, we're like, oh yeah, I already paid with Jesus walking on the water. I'm on to the next story. Like, no, 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 stay there. And then you add in sounds. Now, okay, on the walking on the water, I can see what's going on. I can just hear what's happening here. You can see people are crying out. What is he, what's Mark saying? Mark wasn't there. What, what's, what's Peter saying? What's Matthew saying? What's the, what does the wind sound like? And then you don't just rush, rush, rush off from there. It's like this could take weeks, the one scene. You add in, is it cold? Is it, is it, is it, is it hot? Is it a hot night that, that Jesus is walking across the water? Or what's it, what's it like? What's the water feel like? Then you start interacting like, okay, are you going to be part of this story? The most important thing for me in that, in that like, so I did this long retreat just doing that kind of prayer. At the end of that retreat, I remember getting done with it, and the singular, there were two graces that came out of that retreat. One is, I always thought of Jesus at that, up to that point as like my Uncle Tom. My Uncle Tom, uh, he lived out in California, and uh, I got to see him occasionally and talk to him on the phone. I'm like, oh yeah, I love my Uncle Tom. I, Uncle Tom, I always tell, hey, Uncle Tom, I love you. And I really believed it. But it was like, after that kind of prayer, it was like I had spent a lot of time with my Uncle Tom. So when I looked at him and said, Uncle Tom, I love you, it was like, I know who I'm saying I love you to. And that was what it was like for Jesus. It was like after that much time of not racing through it, I just want to understand the story. I want to get an insight. No, no, no. I just want to spend time with Jesus. So after that time, I could look. I don't know. It was, just, it was a grace, singular grace. I was able to say, Jesus, I actually know who you are, and I love you. That was the number one. The, the second grace, just to open my heart to you, um, was I knew definitively that no matter what, I could trust in God. Like, just such a... That's, that's from him. Um, that no matter what I did, how badly I messed up, no matter what happened, is I just... Out of that time of just spending with him in the Gospels, seeing how he interacted, letting him touch my heart, like, no, no, no. I, I, I know that no, even if I wreck everything, Jesus... I can trust you. Is that, is that, is that more specific? Thank you. Thanks. That's a great question, because all those screen agers are out there. <laughs> Some of them are even like in their 40s. They can't even get off their phones, recording this whole thing. Tweeting about it. Um, no. Um, well, you know, there's this great talk by Simon Sinek about just even that, uh, that hormonal response we get from checking our messages or, or being on our devices. That it's, it's far easier to communicate behind a screen than it is face-to-face. It just takes, it demands something out of us that, that communicating on a screen doesn't, doesn't demand out of us. And so... In order to do this, in order to communicate better, we have to just, I think we have to be more intentional. I, sorry, let me clarify. I have to be more intentional. So one of the things that I've found um, myself having to do is making a decision, whether that means deleting apps that would distract me. I remember at one point I was meeting with one of our focus missionaries, one of our first focus missionaries ever. 
And we're in this one-on-one that we had every week. And at one point, I got a text from someone else in the ministry. I was like, oh, they just, Heather just texted, let me just say no to her. And our missionary said, um, when we're meeting, could you please not text? I was like, uh, yes, okay, of course, absolutely. Uh, I, but it was, she was, she was right. Just like that sense of like, but, you know, uh, we get that kind of behavior that we're willing to tolerate. And so if she was willing to tolerate it, I would keep texting. She wasn't willing to tolerate it, so I stopped very quickly and never picked it back up. But that's the kind of thing. It's like we have this agreement. Um, you know, it's so interesting. We have such curated lives when it comes to not just even a presence on the Internet, but also when it comes to even our, our texts. I mean, how often do you get mad at someone if you texted them and they call you back? Like, no, no, no. That's a faux pas. <laughs> Foul. Like, if I would have wanted to talk to you, I would have called you. I did not call you. Do not call me back. But what's one of the problems with that is like, no, I want to be able to edit my words. I want to be able to think about this. And there's something really great about that spontaneous, actual, incarnational relationship. So what do you do? I think you agree. Someone has to say, let's put our phones away. And away, away. Not let's face down, but like we're putting them away. Um, does that make sense? Or what do you think? Is there more to that? Awesome. Thanks. such a great question. Thank you for that. Um, how can we tell the story in a way that um, people listen? Um, okay, when was the last original movie that was made? I don't know. There's a couple, I imagine. But what, what do we do in Hollywood, even? What, what do we do in Hollywood? What do they do in Hollywood? Is <laughs> You guys, how many Rockies were there? Are there seven? Plus Creed 1 and Creed 2? So this is the story that we've all heard before, but we're going to go pay more money to go see someone tell it to us again. So when it comes to stories, if you get a good story, it doesn't get old. And if you can tell it in a way that is like new, even just repurpose, repackage, it's like, we want to listen to this kind of thing. And so the big challenge for a lot of us is, what's your story? Do I even know my story? Have I practiced my story? So one of the things I love telling, uh, sharing, especially when there's seminarians here, <coughs> is C.S. Lewis gave, a, gave a, a talk to uh, seminarians and to youth ministers in the Anglican Communion. And he said that there should be a final test before men are ordained and sent out to be in, in, the, in the parishes. So that final test should be that, yep, after all the other kind of things are done, they're given a point of doctrine and are being asked to explain that point of doctrine to the average dock worker. And that's the test. If you can take something complex and make it understandable and compelling to the average human being in the parish that you're going to be in, then you're ready to be ordained. If you can't, then you shouldn't be ordained yet. And he made the point, he said, because you're not going to be a missionary to Burma and not be able to speak Burmese. And so if I can't tell the story that hopefully has changed my life to someone I care about, to someone who's right in front of me, then I need to just work on telling the story. Does that make, does that make sense? Because again, there's nothing, there's nothing more exciting than the story. And it's not just the old story. It's the story of what God is doing every single day. The other thing is, again, this is, I don't know how many more questions we get, so I want to share this as well. Um, When it comes to uh, telling the story, when it comes to preaching, when it comes to this, I've been thinking about, um, so priests preach basically almost every day. Right? More or less. Every Mass, you have an opportunity to preach. So you would think this. You would think that if a priest preaches every single day, that in 20 years of doing that every single day, that every priest who has been ordained at least 20 years should be amazing at preaching. <laughs> no, but think about this. I mean, honestly, if you, how many of us think you do something every single day and don't become incredible at it? Unless you're just not trying. This is not, I don't know how anyone preaches here, I just I'm saying. <laughs> but it, but if we, if we thought about it like this. Um, with the proper motivation, with the proper feedback, and with a proper intentional practice, us priests, we should be incredible at this after even five years. 
So the question is, what's missing? Is it the motivation? I don't really want to be able to tell the story to people who show up. Is it no feedback? Like, I don't want to know if it was good. Only tell me if, or only tell me if you didn't hate it. Or am I lacking the intentional practice? Am I lacking, like, sitting down and on, in a real way every single day saying, I'm going to try? You would never expect a professional athlete to be a professional athlete unless they're willing to have intentional practice, get feedback, and have the proper motivation. And that's just to do something like kick a ball or hit a ball or throw a ball or shoot a ball or... <laughs> And we're talking about life and death. So that's my last little thing about that. Maybe there's more. Great question. You might be asking the wrong person <laughs> because you use the word concise. There's a lot of adjectives people have used to describe me and my speaking style. Concise has literally never been used. <laughs> Nonetheless, <laughs> I will try to answer your question. Um, so a principle to keep in mind, regardless of whether this is a three-minute homily or a... Oh gosh, I feel so bad now. Um, I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm just saying that I have cracked the 30-minute mark on a Sunday homily more than once. So... <laughs> But it's their fault. I blame them. i like, if you don't want, just go somewhere else. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but regardless of whether it's a, it really is a, a three, three minute or longer than that, um, I'm a real f- strong believer and I hope to be a strong uh, accomplisher of the idea of a, a one point message. Like this is to be able to, if I can't summarize um, the main point of the homily in one sentence, then um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. So yesterday, as an example, we were doing a series. We do a series on our campus. And um, so the series right now is called um, Underestimated. And the, the, yesterday, the one point was uh, don't underestimate what God is doing when it seems like God is doing nothing. That's it. And it took me 26 minutes to communicate that to our students <laughs> using a number of examples. Um, so one point. And I always ask the question, okay, what do I want them to know? And what do I want them to do? For free, for anyone who is interested, there was a book once. I gave a talk at a Steubenville conference. It was a keynote, maybe one of my first keynotes. And I got done, and I stepped off the stage, and there's a guy named Paul George who was there. Paul George is this awesome human being. And he didn't say, hey, good job. He didn't say, like, that was great. He didn't say anything. He just said, hey, have you read the book, Preaching for a Change? I said, no. He said, you should. And I didn't know what he meant. I didn't know if he was like, wow, that was so good, you should read this book, or like, wow, you need so much help, you should read this book. <laughs> Nonetheless, I've read the book roughly 45 times, and that's the main message of the entire book, is um, you ask the question, what's, what do you need them to know? What do you need them to do? So again, for preachers, I would say, uh, make it even more, more urgent. It's not just what do you want them to know? What do you want them to do? It's, uh, there's this thing called the preacher's burden, and I, I, I believe that a, pre, a priest, anyone, a deacon, whoever is preaching, should not ever get up behind the pulpit unless there is the preacher's burden, which is, this is what they need to know. If they do not hear this this weekend, there is consequences. Um, so what do I need them to know? What do I need them to do? And, and that sums it up, all up. Does that make sense? See, it took me seven minutes to say that. <laughs> Thanks, brother. So, closing, closing remarks. <laughs> um, once again, um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that I'm really grateful for is I'm grateful for the opportunity to come here tonight. I'm really grateful for your patience. Um, I'm incredibly grateful uh, for the existence of technology and, and for Ascension and for letting me uh, even even be here in your presence. The people I keep working with are so good. Um, I was talking to this priest from Tyler, Texas last week. 
And he shared the story. He said, "There's this. He was he was at a rock climbing wall, and he says there's this young woman who's at the rock climbing wall with him, or just happened to be there. And they started talking, and she knew he was a priest, and she was kind of a higher up uh, in the evangelical church down in Tyler, Texas, and." Uh, she had some questions about the Catholic Church. And so he said, well, maybe you want to read this. Let's take a look at this. And she went home. And she called him a couple days later. And she said, uh, so I read John chapter 6 like 30 times. You know, John chapter 6, the bread of life discourse. I said, eat my flesh, drink my blood to have life. She said, I read John chapter 6 about 30 times. And then I found this priest on YouTube and I spent the entire day watching his videos. And so I don't have any more questions for you, <laughs> except for how do I become Catholic? And I was just thinking about this, like, what an incredible opportunity. He, he looked at, he said, we were on Skype, and he looked, and he said, hey, I just want to say thanks, brother, because um, trying to explain all that to her would have taken my entire day. <laughs> And who knows if I would have had the time to do it. And who knows, he said, humbly, he was like, who knows if I would have been able to do it as good a job. But the great thing is, she has a parish now. With this priest that she knows, this community that she has, she got some help from some videos, and now she has a parish. She has some virtual help, now she has incarnational community. She got some online teaching, and now she has a place where she can go and get some in-person formation. And that's why one of the reasons why I really believe that um, evangelization in the new media, it doesn't stop with the new media. It might start with the new media. New media might be part of it, but it always, always, always comes back to relationships. It always comes back to who's there. It always comes back to What's the community do? I think of that sometimes because I get, I get letters probably every day from people who say things like, um, I was raised Muslim and then I saw some of these videos and now I want to become Catholic. I was raised atheist and I saw these videos and all these questions. What do I do now? That I was raised in a different denomination. I, I was taught all these crazy things about Catholics and now I want to learn more. Where do I go? And I, I have to point them to, I just say, what's the closest Catholic parish in your neighborhood? The question is, when that person shows up, what's going to happen? Are they going to find someone who's willing to tell the story? Are they going to find someone who's willing to live the story? Are they going to find someone who's willing to share the story with them? When they walk through that door, are they going to meet a community who sees their need and says, come on in? Because here we can fill that need. That's what I'm hoping for. Thank you again for uh, your time making the sacrifice to come tonight. Thank you, Bishop Senior, for being so welcoming and, and so hospitable, Father Daly, and all the staff here at St. Charles Borromeo. And you guys, thank you all for being the kind of Catholics who are willing to tell your story and are willing to uh, be the kind of people who, when they walk through the door, you're ready. Our glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.